Howdy folks. Uh, I finally picked up um, pretty much the last thing in my uh, test equipment arsenal and that is a function generator. This is the uh, uh, Gray 10 or Graton uh, ATF 20B 20 megahertz arbitrary waveform generator. Uh, I picked this up, uh, it was on sale, I think I paid around f uh, 400 Canadian dollars for this. Um, so in my opinion this is quite amazing value for uh, what I paid. Uh, it's got a full color LCD, uh, like I said, 20 megahertz, uh, full arbitrary capabilities. Um, you can't program in waveforms, but it's got, I believe, uh, 40 preset waveforms, which I'll, I'll show you. So this is going to be pretty much a two-part video. Um, one of them will be a teardown and um, a bit of an analysis on how this is uh, built and uh, how it works. And the second half is going to be a review. Uh, I'm going to hook this up to uh, my scope and I'm going to give you a tour of the UI, the features it's got, uh, some weird quirks and bugs, uh, things like that. So, um, as you can see, it doesn't really fit very well on my bench. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to do the review on the bench, and we're going to have to go to probably a floor setup for uh, the actual review, uh, just because I don't have that uh, nice blue bench that I used to have anymore. So I've got to do this on my desk. <laughs> so, uh, I will uh, get the cover off. Um, it works exactly the same way as uh, most uh, test gear does. You've got the tilting bale, and it's just got this rubber end cap, which I can take off and uh, slide the top off, and then we can see inside. Then I'll go to my, uh, my normal setup. So we've got the thing open now. Um, basically, there's just two screws on the back and a small screw and the uh, rubber cover comes off and uh, then the metal slides off and uh, it, it's uh, very easy to access. Uh, the tilting bale is basically you pull both sides and it's got a number of indentations. So around the back, we have um, two TTL outputs, uh, both 42 volt peak rated. Uh, we also have a modulation in with the same rating, um, so this allows you to do your uh, frequency modulation, uh, phase modulation, things like that. We have an RS-232 port here, um, standard uh, IEC mains, uh, full range. Uh, however, you do have to select the voltage um, with this switch here. The label is a little bit, uh, a little bit skewed here. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the light, but there's uh, holes in the back cover for a bunch of uh, options that are not fitted in this particular model. Um, some of which, some of these may not even be options, some of these may actually be for different products that use this same case. Because the first thing that you'll realize is that this case is pretty much empty. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's due to the fact that they've, uh, they've just reused this case um, from other products. Now the bale can be removed if you want and uh, you basically put it in the upright position like so and you can pull it and uh, get it to completely come off. Although it takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of force but you can remove it if you wish. Which I'll do just to make this a little bit easier. So there's uh, pretty much just uh, one, two, three, well okay. The small boards, let's not count them. It's pretty much just two board construction. Um, so in the corner here, we have the mains lead coming in, or the uh, mains coming in. And uh, the first thing you'll notice is there are these two brown wires here, which go over to this little board with a, uh, a switch on it. So the mains switch does actually switch the mains, which is nice to see. So the standby power of this should be zero. Um, and they've just uh, used some hot glue over top of that, which is a little bit interesting. They've uh, gone to town with the hot glue over here on the fuse block, uh, or the uh, the input selector block, which uh, I think is uh, it's something uh, you don't see very often. I'm not entirely sure why they used that, but they did. Um, we've got our earth terminal here, which is uh, it is actually tight, which is good. Um, there's no shake-proof washer in there, which I would have liked to have seen, but um, they've got two 
uh, two connectors on that terminal. They've got the one from the mains lead and they've also got one from the transformer. So that's nice to see. We've got a little tiny board down here which has just got a single connector on it for the, um, the RS-232 and that connector just goes underneath the chassis uh, to the main board. And this is the power transformer and the first thing I've got to say is this is a really sexy looking power transformer. Um, I can't say that I've ever seen one that looks like this before. There's two coils here and then there's the uh, the iron that goes through it. Um, I can't say I've ever seen something that looks like this before. It looks really nice. Um, and it's got a little diagram on it um, that shows you how it's wired. Um, I'm not sure if they chose this particular transformer because it has noise characteristics or just that's that's what they had available. But uh, definitely not your standard power transformer, linear, uh, linear transformer. But uh, I guess uh, you get what you get. And our main board here um, is just suspended in the middle, like so. That's the uh, the cable for the uh, RS-232. Got some writing here. Uh, there's actually a lot of uh, writing. All of the stickers actually have stuff written on them rather than, you know, just QC pass, QC pass. There's actually writing on almost all the stickers, which is something I don't see very often. And just for completeness on the back panel, We've got the BNC jacks with coax, and there you can see all the cutouts uh, from before. So the output of the transformer comes in here, uh, and they've got two rectifiers, uh, which is interesting, and they're not discrete diodes, they are actually real rectifier packages. Um, they actually go into some smoothing caps, and uh, there's a total of um, four heat sink, uh, five heat sink devices. Um, this one's probably the five volt regulator, um, and these are probably the other uh, strange regulators. Uh, some of them are possibly for the uh, the different core, core voltages in the uh, the FPGA. Now we'll take a look down here in more detail later. But uh, this is the uh, front panel display board. Um, you can see we've got a couple chips on here and a couple of ribbon cables, um, as well as a small board down here, which is for the outputs, which we'll also take a look at later. So. The main board uh, looks relatively uh, relatively standard. On this side, we've obviously got all of our linear regulators for all the different various power supplies uh, that this particular unit needs. And some of them are labeled on the board. Um, you can see plus five volts there. Um, but uh, there's definitely more than just a single plus five volt rail. Um, yeah, that's that's unfortunately the only one that's labeled. But basically all just power supplies and filtering. The capacitors are um, Chang branded. Um, 25 volts. Um, they're 85 degrees C rated caps, which is a little disappointing. I would have liked to have seen 105 degrees C rated caps, uh, but I mean this device uh, as you can tell it doesn't have any fan in it um, Nor does it really need any fan. I had it running for quite a while uh, And I opened it and the heat sinks were they were hot, but they weren't really hot You could still touch them um, and everything else is cool. So I mean pretty much whatever this is which is probably um, a 5 volt regulator actually let me let me just check I may be able to see that. 1085CT. It's not a it's not a 7805, but it's probably a 5 volt regulator if I had to guess. I'm not going to go through all of the chips on this. I'm just going to go through the big major ones um, because at the end of the day, I, I don't really care, um, really. Um, so interesting. We have two socketed chips here, and uh, of course, the main processor here, which is uh, an Altera Cyclone FPGA. This is our 20 megahertz um, crystal. Um, so this is the uh, the main clock source for the device. So obviously, if you wanted to improve the stability, you could uh, replace this uh, with a better with a better uh, oscillator. Um, I don't really have a way of testing the frequency stability of this. 
Um, and at 20 megahertz, I'm not sure how much it really matters. Um, I'm mostly going to be using this in the, you know, less than 10 megahertz range. So, uh, not a big deal. So, I'm intrigued by the fact that we have two socketed chips. Now, they've uh, gone to town with the, uh, the silicone, the white silicone here. Uh, all the connectors, all the ribbon cables, uh, they've just siliconed everything. Um, which is nice to see. Nothing's going to vibrate out. They've even siliconed the board in down here. Um, but they siliconed the chips in the sockets, which I thought was a little strange. So this chip here is an STC... 11F60XE 351PLCC44 uh, so um, I'll stick whatever it is in the corner but uh, just judging by the part number it's probably some uh, uh, programmable logic device of some kind and uh, this chip here uh, I don't know that uh, manufacturer off the top of my head uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, interesting marking. Um, this is a 29EE010 the 70, so possibly uh, E squared prom, uh, I'm gonna guess. We have another uh, another crystal here. Um, this is obviously our main our main crystal here. Uh, but there's another one over here which is a 22.1184 megahertz crystal which is probably for whatever this whatever this device is here. The main processor for the device, or um, just chip in general, is this uh, Altera uh, Cyclone uh, EP1C3T144C8N. Um, so I'm going to guess that's probably got a relatively low number of uh, logic elements in it. Uh, it's just going to be some simple FPGA doing all of the, uh, the waveform generation. We've got a couple other chips down here. Uh, including some through-hole parts, which I thought was a little strange to see in uh, a device like this. Uh, our DAC is right next to the FPGA, as we would expect. And this is an Analog Devices uh, TX DAC AD9708AR. And most of the small parts uh, on the other side of the board are just going to be uh, op amps and things. and. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in what op amps they're using. So uh, that's pretty much it for the chips. There's also a whole bunch of uh, pots down here. Uh, these are obviously for uh, trimming uh, various parameters, so I'm not going to touch them. Um, the main output comes from the bottom through these coaxes here onto this board, which has uh, a total of four relays on it. There's these red devices, um, and just the BNC jacks, and some uh, input protection diodes, and that's really all that's on that board. So the front panel has uh, some memory up there, um, ISSI branded, IS63LV1024L, so that'll probably just be SRAM of some kind, uh, and we have an Altera Max 2 uh, CPLD, which is most likely the display controller given its uh, proximity to the display. Uh, that is an EPW240T100C5N. And uh, the only other chip that's of really uh, uh, any great size here is uh, right under that uh, ribbon cable, and that is a uh, HD. 7279A. Uh, I'm not really going to take out the front panel display board. I don't. Uh, I don't see the need in doing so. Um, all we're really going to see are buttons, the one knob, and the display itself. Um, and none of those are really uh, anything to write home about. So I'm. I'm not. Uh, I have no. No reason to. Uh, to take this off. So on the front panel, uh, we have a USB connector which has been blocked off with some clear plastic um, because this unit does not have USB. There's the uh, the power switch which has a plastic rod which goes to that uh, small board that I showed. Um, this is a full color LCD. I don't know the resolution uh, and you'll see in the review what the actual 
uh, quality is like. It's actually not bad for a product like this. Um, we just have some soft keys here and uh, all of these buttons here uh, and here as well as the outputs light up green. Um, so we have our waveform type, we have our functions, uh, arrow keys, number keys, output enables, and we have a uh, just a, a rotary encoder which does actually have um, a push button action. However, uh, I don't know if the push button actually does anything, but uh, I'll show you all of this in the review. So really, um, in terms of build quality, um, for a function generator which is four hundred dollars in uh, you know Canadian money, um, that's this is pretty pretty amazing uh, for what you're getting. Um, the build quality is perfectly acceptable in uh, in pretty much every way. Uh, I don't see anything um, anything they've done horribly wrong. Um, I don't see any design no nos. Um, so I'm I'm very happy. Um, I mean, the only thing that I would have really preferred to see in this um, is a smaller case. Um, given the fact that this is mostly empty space, they could have easily shoved everything up forward and probably cut the size of this in half, and that would have been nice, um, just because I don't have a lot of space, um, and it would fit better on my desk, but uh, other than that, uh, I have nothing wrong at all with this. So, uh, build quality is good, so now it's on to the uh, how does it actually perform. So here is the uh, function generator in uh, comparison with my uh, Siglin SDS 1072 uh, oscilloscope. This is, I think, the way I'm going to do the, uh, the review, uh, just so I can get it all in frame. So the thing boots relatively quickly. Uh, I'll start it at the same time as my uh, scope, just so you can get a comparison. It just does a little bit of a flash test, and uh, it's up. So. Uh, no ridiculous boot time like some of the newer touchscreen uh, function generators. So just to look at the display, you can see we can see the uh, uh, both channel A and channel B um, all at once. We can see the free. We can select the frequencies, amplitude, offset. Uh, all that stuff is uh, done with the soft keys on the side, um, so you can switch between the two. And then you can adjust it using either the um, the wheel, which is what I'm doing now, or you can type in the numbers and uh, then select the units. Works just like every other uh, function gen you've ever seen. Uh, nothing special at all about that. Now, one of the things um, that some people have commented uh, about these uh, on... Uh, eBay, Amazon, wherever they end up getting these things from, uh, is that it has come in not not like basically not English firmware, um, and they can't figure out how to f uh, change it. Um, if yours is in Chinese and you need to be able to be able to get it to English, um, the way that you do that um, is by pressing the utility button here, uh, and then the third item down is the language and you can just keep pressing that and it'll cycle between uh, the different languages so uh, you shouldn't need to be able to read the screen to get that to get that fixed because um, apparently that was a big issue so the unit comes with uh, two cables uh, it comes with a very simple um, BNC to banana cable uh, as well as just a, a single straight BNC. Uh, it's not a very long cable. Um, it's only about three feet, um, but it's good enough for uh, the demo. Um, so I'm just going to be using channel A uh, and connecting it to channel A. So as you can see we've got a one kilohertz two volt peak to peak uh, sine wave. We'll just enable the output and uh, there we are. No drama. And of course you can see the button lights up green at the bottom here, which is, that's the only indication you get that, that the channel is on. There's nothing on the display uh, to show you whether the, uh, the channel is enabled or not. So I can change the frequency 
And uh, one thing that you'll notice is it beeps when you change uh, units, which I, I really like. So for example, I'm adjusting the kilohertz right now, so 1K, 2K, 3K. But if I go down, for example, 3K, 2K, 1K, now it beeps at me and tells me that now I'm adjusting the uh, this uh, least the less significant figure. So now I'm adjusting the hundreds of K, uh, and it it holds that uh, even if you go back up again. So uh, that's that's kind of nice. Um, it lets you know that you're changing orders of magnitude. Um, so it's got a bunch of uh, easy access uh, functions: sine, square. Uh, triangle wave, which they call ramp, uh, pulse, um, noise, and then there's the arb function. And uh, it says down here, channel a waveform, and it gives you a number. Um, in this case, this is number 20. And uh, you can see this is a, uh, a sine x on x. Um, and the nice thing is it actually shows you a little picture of what the waveform is supposed to look like, uh, which is accurate. I've checked all of them. They are correct. Um, so if you see, you know, let's say the opposite of this on your scope, then you know that you know, it's, it's being inverted somewhere. So uh, it's kind of nice. It's just a quick, uh, you can look at it at a glance and know that you know, that's what you're supposed to be seeing. And you can cycle through all of the different waveforms. So uh, I'll do that now for you. Um, waveform zero is a, uh, a sine wave. Um, one is a square wave. Two is a triangle. Three is an up ramp. 4 is a down ramp. Uh, positive pulse is number 5. Uh, we have a negative pulse. We have a triangular pulse. Uh, upstairs, um, positive DC and negative DC. Um, you have an what they call all sine, which is just rectified, like full wave uh, rectified sine wave. Half sine, which is half wave rectified. Uh, limited sine. Uh, gate sine square root, exponent, logarithm, half round, tangent, sine x on x, noise, 10% duty, 90% duty, downstair, um, this, uh, this uh, dual pulse, uh, negative dual pulse, um, the uh, trapezoid, or uh, you know what I mean. Um, Cosine, uh, bidirectional SCR, cardiogram, what they call earthquake, uh, the pulse, and that's it. So it has uh, 33 waveforms, 0 through 33. Um, and they all seem to be relatively useful. Um, you can set uh, uh, DC offsets on them um, and all sorts of things. The only mistake I've found so far on the UI uh, is in this uh, the channel screen when you when you uh, select the channel button. Um, the word impedance here, the I is not capitalized like the rest of them are. So I mean it's very minor, uh, but that is a mistake um, in the English anyway. I don't know uh, I don't know how the Chinese uh, translations work for that, but um, other than that, no other big issues. So I, I'm I'm quite happy with that. So by selecting frequency, you can change between frequency and period display. Amplitude, you can set that. And you can change between peak-to-peak -peak and RMS. Offset, again, um, you can change between the uh, DC offset as well as uh, an attenuator um, in terms of dB, which uh, you can hear the relays clicking in when you select that. Um, again, wave just allows you to type in the number of the wave that you want or select it with the dial. And impedance, um, you can uh, type in uh, an impedance uh, for things like 50 ohms or whatever, which is whatever you're terminating into and just makes all the voltages look right. So all of these buttons we've already seen. So now going off to the buttons on the, uh, the right here, um, we've got the sweep and this allows you to sweep frequencies so if I show you what that's currently doing uh, it's currently starting at 500 Hertz 
and doing a sweep uh, over a 10 second period. And the settings for this are pretty simple. Uh, we have a start frequency, which is 500 hertz. We have a sweep time. Um, you can select whether you want to sweep up or sweep down, which just reverses the direction. You can switch between a linear and a logarithmic sweep. And uh, you can change um, the, uh, the trigger type here between all, what they call auto trigger and key trigger. Uh, so sweep is very simple. Uh, they have a modulation mode, which I've just selected now. Uh, and this is the frequency modulation. Um, so you can select the carrier frequency, carrier amplitude, modulation frequency, uh, the deviation in percent, and whether you want to work between uh, the modulation waveform that you pick, again using those numbers 0 through, uh, through 32, or if you want to use the external modulation input, which is on the back. The next mode uh, is uh, their um, shift keying. Um, so this allows you to do uh, things like frequency um, shift keying, things like that. So uh, we have a carrier frequency you can select, carrier amplitude, just as before, uh, hop frequency, and uh, an interval as well. Now I have not read the manual for this. Um, so, for example, I'm not entirely sure what some of these options are. I'm just going through them for you. Uh, the primary reason is because the manual is not in English. Uh, the manual you get is 100% Chinese, uh, so it is completely useless to me. Uh, so it only took me about five minutes to figure out how 90% of the scope works. Um, so if there's something that uh, uh, you don't understand here, maybe someone in the comments can help you. Um, I haven't had a chance to use every single function yet, uh, but everything I've tested, which is most, uh, works fine. So, uh, for example, I'm not entirely sure what hop frequency is uh, in, in this context. Um, they have a counter mode here, and this is just a, uh, a frequency counter. Um, pretty standard. Um, you can set a low pass filter, and uh, yeah, I mean, it just it's just a frequency counter. It's not very complicated. Um, they have a, a TTL button um, and this allows you to set uh, two frequency and duty cycles. Um, and uh, these are the outputs on the back of the unit. Uh, we also have that utility menu, which I showed before, which allows you to store and recall memory settings, change the uh, address and the RS-232 uh, baud rate, uh, the language, and it also allows you to turn on and off that uh, button beep. Um, we also have this burst mode, which you can only get into the burst mode if you're in the channel mode, and then you select the burst key. Um, it, you will not be able, you will not go into that mode if you are in any anything before, um, which I guess is okay. It's not really a bug. It's just, uh, um, it's it's just it's just kind of interesting. Um, so in this case, you can select a carrier amplitude, uh, the number of cycles, the uh, the rate, which is the frequency. Um, and you can trigger it off of um, a TTL input uh, or an external trigger, or you can just you can just do it once. And that's pretty much all of the settings, to be honest. Um, if you want to change the uh, um, the channel, so currently we've always been controlling channel A. Um, you'll notice here it says channel A alone, and if you press the channel button again, it then says channel B alone, and then you can set uh, the channel B uh, functionality. Um, now, the word alone, in my opinion, shouldn't be there. Um, I'm not sure if that's just a mistranslation because both of the channels work. Uh, you can enable both channels and um, use them both at the same time, even though it says only channel A alone. And what that really mean, just means is that all this stuff on the display is for channel A. So it really should just say channel A. I, I think that's just a... I don't like that. Um, but uh, the other thing you'll notice is um, it doesn't always um, change uh, the all of the text on the display for that channel. So right now I'm on channel A and it shows me channel A frequency, amplitude, and offset. But if I hit channel and I go to channel B alone now, it says channel B frequency, channel B harmonic, 
but it still shows me channel A, amplitude. You actually have to hit amplitude for it to actually change to channel B, amplitude. So um, I'm not sure if that's a bug or if they've designed that on purpose so that you always know what the amplitude of channel A is. Um, channel B um, also gives you the ability to um, set uh, harmonics and uh, wave phases, um, which you can't do on uh, channel A. Channel A, you can do offsets um, and attenuators, but channel B, you can do harmonics instead. Uh, and it's probably because they only have one attenuator. Um, there wasn't enough relays inside to have two separate ones. So uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much everything in the UI. Um, it's a very simple, and I mean, it's not very uh, not very difficult to use. Um, I mean, I didn't need an instruction manual to figure it out. Uh, it's relatively intuitive, and they only goofed, uh, you know, one or two places. So uh, definitely worth the money, in my opinion. So hopefully this uh, quick teardown and review was uh, helpful for someone. Uh, I, If anyone's looking for a function generator, a hobbyist, um, this is, you know, a great addition to any home lab. Um, the value for money is extraordinary in my opinion. Um, I mean, you can get multimeters that cost more than this. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend it. Um, no issues so far. So, uh, definitely, definitely, uh, a thumbs up from me. However, uh, you do need, uh, you do need to figure it out on your own because there is no English manual, unfortunately. So anyway, hopefully that was uh, helpful and interesting. Thanks for watching.